Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we are recording this conversation on Wednesday, November the 22nd in the Rabbi Samuel Chill Sanctuary. It is Arab Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is tomorrow. And that is actually our point of departure, which is um, how do we think about Thanksgiving when our hearts are not full of Thanksgiving, when our hearts are full of uh, anxiety, worry, fear, um, I was listening the other day to the most recent podcast uh, from Daniel Hartman and Yossi Klein Halevi, For Heaven's Sake, Israel at War. And this was the episode, the most recent episode about the mood of Israel. And Daniel begins by saying this is day 44 of the war. And he then makes this comment just in the matter of the conversation. With It, it wasn't even a big deal. It was a in the flow kind of comment. He said, it's day 44 now, but before you know it, it will be day 88, and we'll still be at war in day 88, and before you know it, it will be day 100, and we'll still be at war in day of 100. And I thought to myself a few things. Uh, one is, how do you do Thanksgiving in that reality? And then one word that we haven't really talked about much uh, since then is God, and I'll, I'll be wanting to talk today about where does God fit in? Can you find God in Gaza anywhere? Can you find God in day 44, which becomes day 88, which becomes day 100 of this war anywhere? So before we begin, um, let's thank God for the gift of learning Torah together, and then we'll just check in. So, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedushan Mitzvotah V'Sivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Uh, colleagues, before we get to God, I wanted to just check in uh, on Thanksgiving, you know, because folks will be seeing this, the Shabbat of Thanksgiving weekend. We're recording this the day before Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving is always all of our favorite time of the year. It's, it's family, it's friends, it's home, it's hearth, it's delicious meals, it's our favorite foods, it's time off. It's a beautiful holiday. And yet, day, you know, we're day 46 of this war. Um, how are you thinking about Thanksgiving when Israel and indeed when the Jewish people are at war? just want to clarify that I wouldn't call turkey favorite food and delicious food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. you know, it's a matter of choice. Yes. How um, are you thinking about, I, about Thanksgiving when we are at war? I have pit in my stomach every day. Every day, it doesn't matter if it's morning or night. I'm reading the Israeli news, and there's a point I cannot take it anymore. And I have to do something else, usually yeah. something stupid, like, you know, watching something silly on TV or right. watching a soccer match or something like that. Personally, you know, my son is coming back from college, first time. Right. So I want to enjoy that as much as it's possible with everything going on in the world. Right. Yeah, I'm with Elias. I think the idea is that, you know, it, that in this very complex, fraught, and um, you know, and difficult time, that we that Thanksgiving should focus on just those little things that can that we can be thankful for. Hmm. Um, you know, your son coming home, sitting with family, um, those small things. Because we, if we lose track of that, we can lose ourselves. I also I, I appreciate the question. I think. Far too often we forget that Thanksgiving feels like this for many people every single year. And that when the holidays roll around and we're missing loved ones around the table, there's that grief and that sadness and where we come to the holidays and we don't have a place to go or where we're going to a place that doesn't feel like the right place, all of those things. So uh, this is exacerbated by the war that's happening this year. But I think it's easy in the holiday spirit to forget about just how lonely and how painful this season can be for so many and I think it's, you know, it's heart-wrenching what's happening. Um, I'm really hopeful that 
you know, Thursday is going to mean that there are little ones that are home back with their families. Um, it, you know, it doesn't solve the war. It doesn't solve Hamas. But hopefully there will be little kids who are less traumatized on Thursday. And, um, and hopefully we're all able to band together, that we use this to sensitize our hearts, to be more compassionate to those who are experiencing the difficulty of the holiday season regularly when the war is over. And we're able to find strength with one another while it's going on. Um, I'm holding a lot of thoughts. One, I, I'm not sure that you, I'm not sure that there's such a thing as, as less traumatized on, on Thursday. Um, but I, but I do <coughs> have echoing in my head the, uh, the Dayenu that we sing at, at Passover time. You know, it's, it's an absurd text <laughs> because it posits things like, if you had taken us out of Egypt but left us here in the desert, that would have been enough. And you ask the question, how? <laughs> that, that absolutely would not have been enough. And yet our tradition insists on saying that every little thing, even when it's not enough, there are moments that we have to say enough. Well, um, thank you for that, guys. Um, How are you doing? How are you thinking about it? Really broken, uh, really broken and really troubled. Um, and I would like to be buoyant and optimistic, but I am struck by the fact that while we can press pause, and I really appreciated Elias saying, you know, you can't deal with the war 24-7, it just will consume you, um, and so we do something that gets us away, you know, th that's why God created, you know, football and sports <coughs> and basketball and, you know, the, the sports pages, because in the end, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter in the big scheme, and it's just great escape, and we need that, and then I'm thinking about the fact that our family in Israel can never press pause, and, um, you know, we, this came home to me because we did a, a Zoom with our family in Israel. Um, and uh, so we had cousins in Israel and the cousins in America all kind of reflecting. And the difference in the experience between Israelis who can never press pause and whose, whose kids are on the front line or whose spouse is on the front line um, and Americans who that's not the reality, is just so, it's just so markedly different. Um, I just don't know where to go with that. And it's, it's really hard for me, you know, and, 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 and that you see the wear and tear. One of the news items that has made a lot of news this week is, you know, Danny Gordon's <coughs> column, you know, divorcing himself from the conservative movement. That's a whole separate conversation. But the main thing I took away from that is how much pain Danny is in, the stress, the pressure, the, the, the fact that he can never press pause, in my judgment, has really kind of, um, has kind of uh, wounded his sensibility and damaged his sensibility and, and caused a rawness. And like, what do you do when, when so much of our loved ones are raw, R-A-W, raw, and you can't really do anything and they can't press pause? And if they can't press pause, it's really hard for me to press pause. So I would say it's been, um, and on the other hand, I just want to say, and then we'll get to God in a second, we, this is for the long haul. If Daniil is right, that day 44 means day 88, which means day 100 plus, this is for the long haul. So that actually does mean that you're all right, that we need Thanksgiving and we need the daily rituals and the, and, and the seasonal holidays to renew us for the long haul. If we all crash and burn, that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, so... I want to talk about in terms of not crashing and not burning and in terms of renewal and in terms of a Thanksgiving that might bring us back or Hanukkah that might bring us back. I want to talk about God. And the question I want to ask is, is God relevant? And I will just share uh, that uh, when I asked this question in my sisterhood class on Tuesday to a person, everybody said, of course not, obviously not not relevant at all. And um, I usually go last, but I'll just go first here. Uh, uh, that comports with my sense of things. God not relevant. Um, God was not in Gaza on October 7th. And to me, God has not been in the picture since October 7th. Um, what's relevant is the IDF. What's relevant is the solidarity of the Jewish people. 
uh, what's relevant is the courage of Israelis, the altruism of Israelis, the soaring civic spirit of Israelis. What's relevant is the generosity of American Jews who raised many, 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 many millions of dollars in no time to help our brothers and sisters in Israel. What's relevant is uh, political advocacy so that Congress continues to uh, send resources to Israel. What's relevant is a lot of practical stuff that has to do with the war effort. And I will just say, from, from, and then I want to hear everybody else's, number one, God not relevant. And then that leaves me with an enduring question. I'm kind of in the God business, like that we're in a house of God. And what does it mean that when we're in our most vulnerable time, God is not relevant, at least to me and to the people in my sisterhood class? What does that mean about this whole project? What does that mean about this whole project when God is not relevant at our most urgent hour? That's what this class is principally about. Colleagues, is God relevant for you? Uh, can I, I, I wanna, since you've mentioned sisterhood, I wanna mention something that happened yesterday at the religious school. I, um, like many of, us, many of us, I teach the sixth graders high 385. And I was going over the prayers, and one of the prayers was the Amida. And we reached the part that it says, Mechaye Ametim. So I started explaining to them that you know, in the traditional way, we think about the messianic area when the Messiah will come, that everybody will be sort of awakening again and coming back to life, and there will be peace around the world, and we'll be understanding. And then one of the students, who is 11, looks at me, and she says, for how many centuries the Jewish people have been using these words, and nothing happens? We are not in a better place because we pray this. And I usually use Michelle's phrase, this is aspirational, you know, that we aspire to be better people and that we hope for a better world. But honestly, I didn't know what to say to her because she was, first of all, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't expecting that kind of reaction from a student who is 11 years old. <laughs> but second, the fact that she's saying, you know, I'm sure she also added that I'm sure every religion prays for the same thing and things don't happen. We are bad, naturally human beings and conflicts and war keep happening. So, to answer the question, um, is God relevant? I mean, <laughs> well, do we as clergy can, can say that God is not relevant? Well, your silence speaks volumes. Well, I, I want to come back, yeah. I, I, and this is, feels like a weird thing to be sitting here defending God, but here we go. <laughs> um, I think that you can still have deep faith in God and still feel abandoned by God. And that that feeling of where is God is itself a relationship with God. And I think that there is, there is something we have to process, which is how do we have a tradition that invites us to believe in a God who is all powerful <coughs> and all present and able to solve all of our challenges and yet absent in the moments that we feel like we need God. And that's a feeling that's really, I think, important to process. I think when you're in dialogue with God and in dialogue with a pain about how you would like God to be showing up and you don't see God in that way, that enables you to process some of that rawness you were talking about before, Wes, in a way that's not on other people. That gives you a, I, an address. Uh, I, I want to just finish yes. this. Gives you an address for, for processing your rawness. And I think also that also gives us a sense that there are more possibilities than we could imagine. When there is a God in the picture, it's not just what we see or what can be seen. It's everything that, that, it, that it, there's, there's possibility beyond our wildest imagination. And I think that's a really important practice. Yeah, one thing I want to say that I want to believe what you're saying, Alisa, and I want to also feel like we are all defending God here. Um, but this is to me what you just said is the comparison that you can make always where, you know, you realize when your friends are really good friends, when you're struggling, when you're going through something bad and they will show up for you, they show up for you. That's when you realize they are people that re really mean something to you. So in this case, you know, having God and not being present in the time where we need him, him, her, it, they, whatever, is tough. But that is a really important example right. because when your friend doesn't show up for you in a time of need, you don't say that friend doesn't exist. You say they don't feel like a really good friend right now. I want to process how they yeah. didn't show up for me. And so that's a really big yeah. difference. Like, I just want to, let me just respond to what you said, Elisa Myra, and then pivot to Michelle and Dan. Um, I'd love to feel abandoned by God. I'd love to feel abandoned by God. I'm just speaking for myself personally. I just feel God is not relevant. Like I always, I always had appreciated people who were angry at God because if they were angry with God, there was a pulse. You could work with something. 
Uh, much harder is somebody who says, God, not even an issue for me. And that's kind of where I'm at now. God, not even an issue for me. I'd, if I felt abandoned by God, I'd feel more hopeful. But the fact that God is kind of not relevant. When I, when I just think about, you know, the phrase, we studied this a few weeks ago in Psalm 130, <laughs> and I, you know, from the depths I call mm-hmm. to you. But really, who do we call from from the depths? From the depths, we called on the Jewish people to give money to CJP. From the depths, we called on Israeli soldiers to risk their lives. From the depths, we reached out to our brothers and sisters in Israel. From the depths, they were making cakes in Israel. From the depths, you we're calling to on... You prayed IDF every single day in the Gen Chapel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I wish I could feel abandoned, uh, but maybe you guys could say something that could be more helpful. So Michelle I, and Dan. I feel like, you know, Wes, every once in a while, when something's not working, you'll call a timeout. Right. Like, I, I kind of feel like calling a timeout Crazy. here. Mm. Like, I, I, I don't... I know you think you you feel what you feel, but every morning you're in the Gan Chapel, and every evening you're in the Gan Chapel. And to Eliza's point, you're praying a lot of words that are directed somewhere, right? So I I, I think that God is most powerful when you struggle with God. That's the text you brought right. today. That's Israel. That. I think Jacob, Jacob self would have said, look, what's helpful? I, I ran off to the, I took care of me. My mom sent me away. I went and I made my living. I went, I made a future for myself. God's not relevant. And suddenly Jacob in this, in this Parsha that you brought right. has this moment where Jacob sees God and says, whoa, God was here and I didn't know it. And then we get into the piece that you want to talk about, which is the negotiating. But to Elisa's point, you can only negotiate with someone who is real, who exists, who you can have a relationship with in your life. And some of that negotiation is show up for me, right? I I need you to show up for me. And some of that relationship is saying, and you didn't show up for me, and here's how I feel hurt by that but that relationship happens every morning and every night well not to sound like our dear congregants but um you know garfinkel goes to talk to cone <laughs> to god and cone goes to talk to garfinkel i do go to minion every morning and every night and i do find it deeply meaningful and anchoring but what i get out of it is the people what but I that's get out of so it is interesting that's that's so ironic because if you were I to look at, at yes. if you were to look at the two of us at morning right. minion right? I'm walking around schmoozing with everyone (laughs) who's there, right? I'm literally walking person to person to person saying hello, right? Experiencing that beautiful blessing of of going to to meet God with the people. And you are sitting in your chair with a book like this. Well, it's, 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 it's aspirational. Um, I want to I wanna get Dan, just a preliminary comment, and then we'll get, and we'll we get to Jacob. Can we just a little bit longer? I'm we'll, loving it. We'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, Dan, do you have a preliminary comment? I'm with, um, with Michelle and with, with Elisa. I, I think God is 100% relevant. And I just think of that, you know, the old, like it said, you know, Cone and Garfinkel, but also the old, the old joke about the person who's, um, who's in a flood and, you know, then a boat comes and a helicopter comes and the person doesn't take either. Right. Uh, and then, and then sadly, you know, drowns and it goes to heaven and God says, uh, and he says, he says, God, where were you? And God right. said, well, I sent you the boat. I sent you the helicopter. So that they, that, that God, that God is relevant because uh, even though God may be hidden, God's presence is, uh, can be accessed. Okay. Uh, Wes, Wes yeah. one more thing. I, I read an article, you probably read it yesterday, about a Bedouin woman who was able to save 20 or 25 people who were at the, at the um, party, mm-hmm. all right? And that, to me, seems like Malachim Yol- Olimbe Yordin, <laughs> okay. you know, the okay. uh, angel of God coming down and helping the Jewish people. Okay, so let's so God take, was there. Okay, let's take a look at our portion this week, which is Vayetze. Um, and let's just read it. Uh, and I have an address in this text that for at least for my, my current thinking of God uh, as of November 22nd this morning. Um, so, um, Michelle, would you just read for us, uh, starting with, uh, you know, page one, Jacob left Beersheba. Sure. On page uh, 166. In the- there you go. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. 
he came upon a certain place and stopped there for the night. And the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream. A stairway was set on the ground, and its top reached to the sky, and the angels of God were going up and down on it. And the Lord was standing beside him, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The ground on which you are lying I will assign to you and to your offspring. Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the families of earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is present in this place, and I did not know it. Shaken, he said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the abode of God, and that is a gateway to heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He named that site Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. Jacob then made a vow saying, If God remains with me, If he protects me on this journey that I am making and gives me bread to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's abode, and all that you give me I will set aside as a tithe for you. Great, thank you. So there's a lot about this text that, you know, calls out, to me anyway, especially now. But I want to start with the obvious question, which is, um, number one, you know, God appears in a dream and says, remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and will bring you back to this place. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you, right? So it's pretty good in terms of a divine protection and promise. And in fact, Jacob then says, surely the Lord is present in this place and I did not know it. And then he actually... uh, you know, he, he does he, he, he does some kind of a, a prayerful, worshipful moment and, and has a pillar and oil and renames the city. That's a whole interesting separate conversation. And so he feels like very full of, suffused with God. And then after all that, he makes the vow, if then, if then, if then, if you are with me, if you give me clothing to wear, if you give me food to eat, if... I come and go on my journey safely, and I arrive home. If you're with me, then, then you're my God, and I'll be with you. And the negative implication is, if not, not. And my question to you guys is, why the if-then, after such a robust assertion, by God, I am with you, and I will never leave you, and by Jacob saying, surely God is in this place, why the if-then, after all that? It, to me, it makes total sense because he's still in a life-threatening moment. He's still by himself in the desert. He's still fleeing from a terrible situation, having just lost all of his family connections. And it's one thing to feel deeply connected to God in a dream when God is standing right there and saying, I'm with you and I love you and I'll support you and I'm going to do all these things <laughs> for you. But it's another to hold on to that feeling when you wake up to the realities of the world around you. And <clears throat> what's interesting to me about this is that the place doesn't change. The realities on the ground don't change. His name of that place changes. And his feeling has the capacity to change. He's sort of, even having God whisper in his ear, right? Even having God speak to him, he's still like, hmm, all right, well, I'm going to hedge my bets. If you if you exist, I'm, I'm good with it. And if not, not so much. But um, to me, it, it, that's a logical, like, it makes sense. Uh I, I, I yeah. love this comment that is here in our Eitz Chaim Chumash, where it says, um, along with food and safety, Jacob is praying for a sense of God's presence. In, and I think that's something we all pray for, right? Not, not just that God will be there as that kind of invisible actor or in the Mr. Rogers way of God's in the helpers and in the response, but that, you know, each of us long 
for a relationship where God makes God's self manifest in the world so that we can say, wow, you're really here. We really see this. We know you. And too often, like Jacob before us, um, we can be at times disappointed when we face our life's challenges and it doesn't feel like God is walking with us. How do you guys see this text intersecting with this moment for the Jewish people? I mean, Jacob is the eponymous ancestor of the Jewish people. He is alone. He is vulnerable. He is afraid. We are alone. We are vulnerable. We are afraid. How does this text connect with our reality? What's the message of this text to this moment? I think one message is the importance of coming to a quiet space and a prayerful space, that getting out of our reality might enable us to channel a connection to God that might help us, that while we're awake to all the dangers and reading the news and obsessing about what the IEDF is doing or not doing, what agreements they're making, that's not a space that we can hear God's voice. But when we get quiet and and are able to find a space where we can hear God speaking to us, that provides solace for us and that also gives us the strength to move on. Mm. So the connection is about prayerful space as a source of renewal and you know, dialoguing with the invisible other as a source of a strength. But I think, I think that, I don't know, I feel bad about this class butchering God here, but um, <laughs> it feels to me that when we go together for pray and, and these are beautiful meetings and beautiful and meaningful events that the outcome is that we feel better, but the reality doesn't change. Well, but maybe so, the reality does change, right? There's the, there is that old expression that the service begins after the service, mm-hmm. right? right? And, and what we are inspired to find here right. is a manifestation of God. So can I just make the case, you know, the, the God not relevant thing that you guys, you know, jumped on me for, I want to say, I think the address for that is Jacob's vow at the end, um, in the following way. I mean, Jacob's vow, if then, if you look at the later pages in the, in the handout, which was scanned and sent to the congregation, you'll see the commentators knock Jacob for this if then, and they say it's not cool to bargain with God. It's not okay to bargain with God. That, what do you mean if then? You're not negotiating with God. He's, God is the creator of the universe. Not okay, Jacob. And I want to say, I feel that this Jacob... Uh, posture at the very end is where, at least where I am, uh, in the following way. I happen to be, you know, we all teach on Tuesdays, and I'm teaching seventh graders Zionism. And, uh, and yesterday <laughs> I taught uh, the seventh graders the Six Day War. And I taught the Six Day War through photographs. And I showed them three photographs uh, having to do with our capturing the Kotel. One is the iconic photo of those soldiers when, behold, after 2,000 years, they have the Kotel. The second is the first service at the Kotel, which is with Rabbi Gorin blowing the shofar, and you have soldiers stopping, and you see one soldier putting on tefillin and holding a sidur. First time Jews have prayed at the Kotel in 2,000 years. And then the third photo was of Jews dancing the hora at the Kotel on June 7th, 1967. And to me, that is the if-then vow of Jacob. You know, if you will be with me and give me, you know, clothing to wear and food to eat and presents on my journey, and I'll be safe and back home, then I'm with you. And that's, and and so you could feel God palpably there in 67. And, and if, and I, and I asked our seventh graders, what would you do if you were in the, if you were in the army at that time, if you were a civilian in Israel at the time, what would you be doing? And they all said, oh my God, we would be davening, we'd be praying, we'd be dancing the horror. And I would be davening and I'd be praying and I'd be dancing the horror. That's the if then. Um, I would have been so, it would have been so easy to have believed in God in 1967. Now I think about all these soldiers who are dead in Gaza, and day 44 becoming day 88, and every day more beautiful 20-somethings and 30-somethings and 40-somethings are killed and families grief-stricken, it's really hard to dance that horror. And for me, it's really hard 
So I actually think Jacob's vow is really profound because it's honest. And it says there is a correlation. There is a correlation, God, between the outer life and the outer world I inhabit and my inner life. And when the outer world calls out peace and blessing, my inner world feels peace and blessing. And when the outer world calls out loss and senseless tragedy and hopelessness, that's my inner world. I think that's what Jacob's vow is. I think that's where I am. And that's why it's been so hard for me with God. Yeah, but when, I, I, I want to say something. Um, we, we, we had a CJP event here. Uh, I don't remember exactly when it was, two or three weeks ago. And we have a um, relatively young man who was talking that he was going to leave his wife and children and go to fight. All right. So I don't think that God makes a role in those moments because you are going in a very dangerous situation. All right. For whatever reasons, for a higher cause, for your own decision, because we feel we need to defend our country, you go into a dangerous place. So, although we want the best outcome, it's not the same that you are driving around Newton and a tree falls in your head. You know, this is a very different situation where, I mean, do you think that God plays a role there? I mean, I, I remember when you were reading, I was laughing at myself because I remember I was in high school, I was a rascal really rascal. I didn't like to study. I would only care about music and going out and sports and girls. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, but, but I would come to temple and pray, God, please help me with a test tomorrow. You know, if you help me, I'll do, I'll do so well in life from now on. You know, it was transactional and it was the whole thing. So, I mean, there are different situations. We cannot put together the, the whole idea that God doesn't show up when each one of the situations are very different from each other. I think the, the Jacob um, piece is, you're so right. It's so human. It's so real. It's so that high schooler, you know, help me on the test, and I'll believe in you if you show up right. for me. And it's, it's very um, contractual. I actually think that's why it's here. Our tradition is amazing in showing us the full story and the, right. all of the feelings that humans can feel and you're in a Jacob moment, I think it's really important to note that our tradition doesn't leave Jacob there. Jacob becomes Israel and Israel is the one who wrestles with God always, who's constantly seeking and looking and trying to find a, a relationship that actually helps Jacob become Israel to, I mean, we're, we're named for this idea, Israel is named for this idea that we we feel and we hold the presence of God, even or perhaps especially when it's hard. Um, I was going to say also that I think the relevance of God is in the scenario in this in our lives in the world of you know being Jewish for a millennium is um, is the is the long game, you know that this when Jacob is asking here. Um, you know, be with me, be with me. I, if you do this, I'll be with you, and etc. Um, then uh, it doesn't mean it's going to happen right away. It, it, it creates the uh, the idea that God is the fulfiller of promises, and you know the promise that God made to Abraham. Abraham did not see that fulfilled, nor did uh, nor did um, uh, Yitzchak, and nor did nor did Yaakov. Um, it all ha it all takes thousands, of, uh, hundreds of years after that full of mm -hmm. fulfillment. So, um, so the relevance of God, I think, in this in this whole you know connection, is the idea that that um, that we continually um, look for God's presence, and when God's uh, and and God's presence will get us through the hard will get us through the hard times, and that eventually <coughs> God will fulfill the promise of bringing us to the land, and the land will have peace. Um, it's it it happens in fits and spurts, but. Um, that we have to continually, um, continually uh, believe that and, mm. and be connected with God that way. There's one other thing that feels really relevant to me, and that is um, when we're going through a hard time, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, one of the things I found most difficult is not knowing what will happen, not knowing what the outcome will be or when it will resolve or how it will resolve, and that not knowing 
um, feels paralyzing and fills me with anxiety and fear and grief. And what's interesting for me about our ancestors is God says to them, like, here's what's going to be. Like, there is no doubt what's going to happen. I'm going to spell it out for you. This is exactly what's going to be. You're going to be slaves for 400 years. Okay, well, that's well, less good. But, 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 that. right. but in this but, case, like, they get to think. And then it's like, okay, but how – they don't have the anxiety of what will be. They have the anxiety of what is. And I think we have the anxiety of what will be. Um, and that's just like really important. And I, I, yeah, no, I, I want to pick up on the f- those 400 years because actually I think that's a really critical piece of the answer to that Jacob voice inside of us, which is those 400 years, you know, generations lived and died in pain without seeing the redemption, without feeling God looking up every day and saying, where are you? Right. And and that's a piece of our history, too. And the answer to that Jacob voice that says, well, only if I'm in the generation that sees you, will I have a relationship with you Mm -hmm. has to be met. Dan, thank you for bringing it up by the fulfillment of our larger Jewish story, which says you might not be in that generation that feels and experiences the the blessing right. that comes. But there I mean, are hard times and there are hard places I mean, and there are loss and there are traumas and tragedies. Like a question for you. Has it ever been a generation that we can say God was there? For sure. Well, I, the foundation of the state of Israel. How many people die? But how many people lived? Look. Yeah, but we are talking about <laughs> one individual person, not the global thing. But look, that's that's right. the voice of the of the trauma of our people through the Holocaust, right? And okay, where where was God? Where I, I yes. mean, really, right? And that's, that's this a generation on steroids from forty one to forty five, and then three <laughs> years later in forty eight. So and, and yet we and yet we stood in those places, and you prayed the most glorious prayer of Yiskor, of remembrance, and I can speak only for myself, but when your voice was rising up to the heavens, I certainly felt the presence of God there. Let me close the class with just a granular question. Um, Jacob's alone, vulnerable, and afraid. And he says to God, if you will be with me and give me food to eat, clothing to wear, and safety on my journey, I will be with you. And the negative implication, and if not, not. What does that voice say to you now? I'd like to close with that question. Yaakov Avinu's voice as a young man, if then, what does that voice, what's the message of that voice to you personally now? Why don't you start by giving us an example? Uh, Yes, that's where I'm at. Uh, To me, it's a cautionary tale. It's easy to fall into that place um, and very challenging to see the face of God when we are in this place. Um, And yet, Dan, thank you for bringing up the idea that we're part of a, a larger story that transcends any given moment to me continuing to lift my eyes up and say, okay, God, (laughs) time, it's time, please come now, is how I make it through this moment. I would say I continue praying to God and remain hopeful. I think it's okay to be Jacob. I think it's okay to say, I'm going to dial into spiritual experience when I can feel a probable change in my existence and my ability to face reality. And I think that's a, a really big ask on spiritual community that we have to be um, cultivating the spiritual spaces where people come in and it's not a question where people come into this space and have a prayerful experience that leaves them feeling so much stronger and so much more equipped to face the, the fears of the world that they're never asking that if then they're they're saying i'm gonna go because yeah i think um i'm I'm with elias i think we need to uh continually look to god's presence um and the idea that the, the flip side of what i said the idea that um that while we can look at the long game you know for us individually in the moment we need to we need to see the face of god and I think part of that is daily prayer, 
and part of that is um, is also saying to God, where are you? So I'll just close with a vignette that happened uh, Monday night. Elias was actually there. Um, we had at our evening minion a woman named Yahala Lachmish, who is an Israeli woman. She is a, she's a, a chazan. She teaches chazanut uh, at uh, the Schechter Institute. Um, <clears throat> she is a, a, a cantor both for uh, Beit Prat, and, and, and leads a service for a thousand young Israelis, um, and also for Tzion with Tamar Eldad Applebaum. And um, so she's kind of the voice of a rising generation of Israeli daveners. And she was with us on Monday night, and she came to Boston during the war, kind of as she called it, shlichut, kind of to be an emissary and to connect with Bostonians. She did a concert uh, at Hebrew College on Sunday night. Anyway, on Monday night, so she's there, and she was going to deliver uh, some words and also sing. And we uh, were waiting for the Amidah to end, and everyone has ended the Amidah except for Yahala. And she's going, you know, and it's just taken her a very, 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 very long time, way longer than anybody else. And when at last she had concluded her Amidah, um, she came and delivered some words, and she explained that every Amidah, she lists by name 130 people that she knows who are currently in Gaza. Hmm. And she prays that God is going to guard and protect each of them. And so by the time she remembers all 130 names, it takes a while. Um, and then she did this uh, prayer for the hostages that was so beautiful it tears your heart out. So this is to say, um, I'm kind of with Jacob. I'm a little bit iffy nowadays. Um, but there is something about being together in the Gan Chapel or the Rabbi Chil Sanctuary when everybody who is in pain and seeking comes together. If there's a God, that's where you find it. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Happy Shalom. Thanksgiving.